Okay. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, apparently we've got 12 people at home and 20, what did I say? 20 people in the hall. So 32 altogether. Uh, well, last Sunday, I was thinking how to introduce our speaker, John here. And just after I'd watched uh, the country file weather forecast and the weather forecast said that tonight it was going to be minus nine and there was going to be lots of snow. Uh, and as I sat down to write this, I had a, a horrible sinking feeling. This has happened before, I thought. <laughs> and sure enough, when I looked up in my records, I found that John had turned up to give a talk on the sounds of bats on the 11th of January in 2005, and it had snowed. And there was a weather, for, weather warning on the radio and the television, and virtually nobody turned up. And it was, this, it was the smallest audience we ever had. And I felt so guilty because he put so much effort into this talk and he had lots of uh, uh, apparatus to, uh, so we could hear uh, bat sounds, which he carted in. Well, obviously he's either forgotten about it or he's forgiven us because here he is again this evening <laughs> and the weather forecast thankfully is not as accurate as it might be. And at the moment it's a lovely night here. And we don't even have to worry about uh, turnout because we've got a Zoom audience and no doubt you would have stayed at home if it had been uh, snowy. Well, there's a good chance that many of you will know John because if you've got children, he might well have taught them biology because he was a teacher at Wallace High School and then at Alloa Academy. He certainly taught most of my children. However, he's also had a very long association with our group. Back in the days when it was known as Central Region Branch of the SWT. The first record I could find in my, uh, the papers that I've been bequeathed, which aren't complete, was that in 1983, he was involved when he brought the Panda Club from Wallace High School, remember them? <laughs> and he's, it, this group planted many of the trees at canvas pools before really the pools were created. Uh, in 1984, that's the next year, he became the, res, uh, the convener of the Reserves Management Subcommittee. And at that time, we were looking to collect nature reserves really we were trying to get money to buy them at that time we had canvas uh, flanders moss uh, was one of our reserves canvas pools as you've just uh, heard was in the making and there was one called lagan fen which was near uh, calendar which unfortunately never became a reserve and there was one other which is still around which was the aberfoyle Bat cave, and you can guess <laughs> who put that forward. Was it? And I read that it was the first place that Natura's bat was recorded in Scotland, was in this cave. And later on, I'll show you a picture. John has been there recently in the last few weeks. I'm hoping he can tell us something about how it's gone. John was also the chairman of the Reserves Committee until at least 1994, maybe later, I don't know, My rec the records I was given ran out then. And during the in intervening period, he was involved with some quite big projects. Uh, there was the one where the, they actually removed birch scrub from Flanders Moss using helicopters to, uh, no? And or in the notes it says about helicopters, maybe the... my, my involvement with Flanders Moss stopped when uh, basically SWT as a whole took over the interest in the site for uh, peatland management, you know, for bog management, right. when there was a big 
bulk management project and you know basically we were sort of pushed out of the way and uh, it was became centralized that's right the Just to explain, the microphone is for the people at home. Yes. Okay. So there, there's nothing... Sorry, we're... It's... People at home can hear this better than they can in the hall, I'm afraid. Uh, so I'll be shout even louder. John's a school teacher. He'll be able to uh, raise his voice, I think. We can't have... There are on the wall up here, you can't see them. There are some big speakers and they have church services in here so they probably need them but we found that if we send this sound through the speakers we get a sort of echo in effect so we have to limit what comes through the microphone uh, to those who are at home anyway as john said uh, about this time the professionals in the swt started to take over uh, all these activities we had a professional took over canvas pools for instance and one also took off the Flanders Moss. Uh, at the same time, there was a lot of work going on landscaping canvas pools, making them deeper, creating islands for uh, birds to nest on and so on. However, his main interest has obviously always been bats. And I'm not sure how he managed to do this because he, I've already seen two things that he was doing in 1984, but apparently he also set up the Central Scotland Bat Group in 1984. Uh, and he remains chairman of that today. So welcome, John. Well, welcome back, actually. He, although he comes to every meeting, I think. Uh, and uh, John this evening is going to talk about Bats and trees, radio tracking, tree roosting bats in the west of Scotland. So I'll hand over Put that in your pocket. If you're really struggling to hear, I can speak fully loud. loud. I hope you can hear me. My training was from. Teaching for 30 years in a secondary school. <laughs> right. And I have to stay here. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, trees. I often get asked questions about bats and trees. Oh, can we have a, a light on for, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes and then, then we'll, I'll refer to the slides. Uh, is that all right? Um, yeah, I, I often get asked questions, you know, and particularly in association with SWT and the concerns about planning, planning applications, but it can be just, it, it, it can be locally or it can be anywhere, anywhere in Scotland, I will get people phoning me up and saying, I've seen bats flying around these trees and they want to cut them down or they want to build next to them, you know, what can we do? And well, Basically, they are flying next to the trees, but they are not protected uh, in only in certain circumstances. Their, their roosts are protected where they, where they roost. And bats will fly several kilometers, some of them, to, uh, to feed. And so when you see bats flying around trees, they're feeding usually. Um, and to actually find where bats are actually roosting in trees, basically, you've got to climb them. Um, now, I don't climb trees. I, 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 there are plenty of people who are qualified to, to climb trees. And, uh, you know, I will find, if I need somebody, I'll find somebody who's qualified and able to climb trees, preferably with bat skills as well. Um, because mostly they are in places you just can't see from the ground. Um, I, there's a few circumstances where I've actually managed to find a bat roost in a tree. Sometimes in hot summer days, uh, if you're walking past the tree, uh, you, you can hear some noisy bats. I mean, that's, that's, I found one or two roosts like that, but um, only accidentally, really. Uh, some bats are really noisy in the summer in their tree roost on a hot day. Most bats are pretty quiet, or they may just be too high up the tree to actually hear anything. Um, 
Some another way is to actually uh, follow bats back at sunrise or before sunrise. And again, you might find them swarming around a tree and then going into the tree. Often you can't actually see which tree it is. And most times you can't actually see where it is. So the information that I have on bats and trees is mostly from putting little radio tags on bats and following them and finding out exactly where they are roosting. Um, so that's going to be much of uh, my talk, but we'll start with just a sort of general account of uh, what bats we have. So we can have the lights out now. Okay. Um, so this is what we have. In the UK, there are 18 resident species, 18 that breed here. Um, and basically, as you go further north in the UK, you get fewer and fewer species. So within Scotland, we've got nine, definitely. Um, and by the time you get to, well, around about this level in, in the country, we've got perhaps six species, seven species. Um, once you get to Orkney, one species. All right, Orkney and the Outer Hebrides, one species makes it that far. Um, and we'll actually you know, have, have breeding sites there. Okay, so that's the species we have. Um, the um, bottom lot are relatively small. Uh, Noctual is what we call a big bat, and Liza's bat, medium sized. Um, Brown long eared bat, also much the same size as the rest there. Now, just to give you an idea, um, there's a two pence coin. And most of these bats are either just less than a two, the weight of a two pence coin, which is seven grams, by the way. Um, and one or two are a little bit more. Um, Liza's bat is about twice that weight. So the weight of two, two pence coins. And even a noctule, which we regard as a big bat, is about four of these. Uh, you know, 25, 30 grams, that sort, sort of thing. Uh, or another comparison is that uh, a packet of crisps weighs 25 grams. So even a big bat doesn't weigh much more than a, a packet of crisps. Okay. Um, so just to show you some nice pictures, I've got to go backwards with this. Um, so here we have uh, probably the, the prettiest bats that we, that we have in Scotland, the brown long-eared bat. Uh, there is, it, we always call it the brown long ear bat because this is a gray long ear bat, very close relation, but it's only found in the very south of England in the UK. So, you know, no gray long ear bats further north than that. So, we can be guaranteed that any we have in Scotland are brown long ear bats. Um, then there's the, the pipistrels. Now, the name is unfortunate for the common pipistrel because. Yes, it's common in the south of England. Uh, it's common in Orkney and uh, um, Outer Hebrides, but over much of Scotland, certainly central Scotland, it is not the most common. Uh, the most common is, is sorry, I must remember to press the right button. Um, the soprano pipistrelle. Uh, this is the one that I get most involved in giving advice on uh, for Nature Scott in particular. Um, when people have huge numbers of these in their house. Common pipistrels never get large numbers and they're not usually a problem. If people have problem with, problems with bats, unfortunately, it's these um, uh, soprano pipistrels. Lovely bats, only five grams, but if you've got 2,000 in your house, um, you would notice them. Now, that, that is exceptional, but it, in central, in Stirlingshire, let's say, a good stable colony can be three to 500. Three to 500 females. Um, this one is the third uh, pipistrelle, which is very rare. Uh, and we would like to know more about where these are found. Um, it, they're very difficult to find them. Um, slightly bigger than the other two. Weighs about the same as a two pence coin. And this is the big one, the noctule. 
uh, very sleek, glossy fur, um, and they're lovely bats. Um, of these bats that I listed there, all of them can be found in trees. All of them, over thousands of years, were adapted to live in trees, in tree holes. But a lot of them have subsequently found um, house, well, buildings in general, but particularly buildings with wood in them as uh, big artificial tree holes. Um, and so there are exceptions. Noctual, very rarely in the UK do you get them in buildings. Uh, they are tree roosting. However, if you go to parts of Central Europe, you will get, get them in buildings as well. Um, and this one, oops, how is it? Doesn't seem to be doing anything now. Next one. As it's frozen. Okay, let, let me try this and see if it'll work. Yeah, it's working now. Okay, um, so this one is a smaller version of the of the noctule called Eliza's bat, and this is about half the size of Eliza's bat, or twice the size of a, a, the likes of a, a long-eared bat. Um, so it's sort of medium-sized bat, um, and this one that. Uh, I've only once seen in, in a building in Scotland. Um, otherwise, they are tree roosting. And, um, and these are the ones I'm particularly going to talk about, first of all, um, because we didn't really know much about them at all. And they turn out, they turn out to be all over the west co coast of Scotland or west and southwest of Scotland. In Ireland, they have adapted to living in buildings much more. So you will get roosts of uh, female uh, lizard bats in, in parts of Ireland, um, but not in Scotland. Um, so just to show you the relative size of this, this is what we're calling a medium-sized bat, and that's my hand there. So you can see that, you know, they're not, they're not that big, and he's obviously a male. Oh, stop working now. Thank you. Um, then we've got the what we call the myotis bats. That's the genus, um, <clears throat> and they're all quite similar, and they're all they all um, echolocate in a very similar way, and they're quite difficult to tell apart um, in all sorts of ways. But this one is is the one that that you are likely, particularly if you're a, um, anywhere near a river or edge of a loch, and you see bats skimming the surface. Uh, you can see this um, on the University Loch, Stirling University campus. Um, uh, every night in the summer, you can get these foraging over the water. Where they're roosting is another matter. It's difficult to, to know where they're coming from. Um, but uh, yeah, you were good. I mean, I, I live in Dunblane, and uh, I know that, that uh, I can go to the river in Dunblane and see um, these bats virtually any night I want to, uh, skimming over the surface. Okay, so this is, you can see there, there's uh, insects on, dotted around on the surface there, and that's what they're, they're after. They even, they have quite big feet, and they will actually trawl the insects off the surface, um, as well as catching them in flight. Uh, and this is a close up. So they're quite cute, really, um, when you see them close up. Um, when you see bats with uh, their teeth showing, uh, they're not really that, not, well, they're not aggressive at all. Uh, they are defensive. So if you're handling a bat, uh, and I don't recommend it, then they will try and bite you. Um, but um, generally, they have tiny teeth, and these are ideal for like, catching little insects uh, or even big insects, um, but uh, they can't usually do you much harm. And this is a close relation, Natterer's bat. So Roy's already mentioned Natterer's bat um, in connection with Aberfoyle, um, Aberfoyle Quarry Tunnel, 
um, which we can mention later, but I, I wasn't really going to talk much about that. But this one, yeah, this shows how little we know about bats is that 1970, that was first discovered in Scotland um, in the 20th century. Turns out there was, an, there was a one in the Royal Museum Scotland, which was collected in the 1800s. And that's the only other one I, I know of that's been found in Scotland. <clears throat> but, you know, they are uh, quite widespread, not, not as common as some of the others. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're nice bats. <laughs> I, I like these. Um, but 1970, um, later on, in the summer, the same guy that, f that was interested in caving and found these bats underground uh, in the Aberfoyle quarry, uh, he found a, a roost at uh, Balmaha of about, about 100 of these uh, in a building in Balmaha, um, a summer, summer roost. And this is the last of these <coughs> Myotis bats that we have. Uh, it's the smallest, it's pipistrelle size, four, four, four and a half to five grams. Um, and uh, looking very fierce there, but actually, again, that's <laughs> for a very good reason, because mammals are usually described on their dentition, their teeth. And so to tell this apart from another species, which we haven't found in Scotland yet, called the Brant Brant's bat, um, uh, you have to look at the details of, of the teeth. So you have to get uh, a good close-up photograph is I find is the easiest way you know in the past it would just be trying to get the, the bat in the right angle and using a, a, a loop to and a, you know bright light to see the the teeth but digital photography is is a great help okay so a quick run through a year in the life of a bat um, at this time of year bats are hibernating uh, the one on the, on the right there, that's a brown long-eared bat. You can't see its ears because when it's hibernating or when it's at, at rest, when it's torpid, that is, it's dropping its body temperature down to ambient, um, it tucks its ears underneath its wings. So you can just see, um, you can just see there's the, the ear just disappearing under the wing there. And, and they do often hang quite free like that. But they're often they're often against the surface, and the, and that's in the Aberfoyle Tunnel. That one, um, the the top one is a pipistrelle, and pipistrelles do like more exposed above ground or in cellars or uh, crevices in roofs or, or old stone walls, sort of places they can squeeze into. Um, very difficult to find pipistrelles in the winter because generally they're, they're places that we can't get into, we can't see, they can. Um, that gap that he's peering out of, or she's peering out of, uh, is about 10 millimeters. Um, so, you know, that's the sort of gap they like to get into. Um, so, during hibernation, they're surviving on their body fat. Um, they've had to feed up in the autumn and add on plenty of body fat to survive because there's no insects around that they can feed on in the winter. They don't hibernate all winter. They will waken up. They're waking up for reasons of having a pee, for example. Um, and if they're in a place which is too cold, they might have to waken up and move to somewhere warmer. Uh, or if it's too, a little bit too warm, it's getting warm by the sun during the day, they might find somewhere colder. So you will actually see bats flying at any time of year, occasionally. And, you know, I get reports of these. Um, okay. The other thing that they do in the autumn is they mate. And they are pretty well unique, unique in mammals in that the females... Uh, and males are in peak condition in the autumn, and the males certainly are in peak condition, and they're um, they're mating with females, and the females have this system of actually storing the sperm. Um, other mammals will be able to start the um, development of the egg, and and keep the uh, the egg in a uh, a very basically a cluster of cells stage. 
Um, but they, they are, bats are different. They, they can mate when it suits them. The females um, keep the sperm in a, you know, in a kind of little pouch next to the uterus. Um, and in the spring, when they've emerged from hibernation, so we're talking about March, April, uh, and the females are recovered from hibernation, then they choose when to become pregnant. Um, and they only have one baby per summer. Um, so there's a, there's a baby bat born right about midsummer. Um, it's always right about midsummer, uh, 21st of June, but it can be slightly earlier or slightly later. Depends on the weather, depends on the species. Um, and that's a newborn baby bat on my thumb. Um, one which we fortunately managed to get back into the roost where it had fallen from. But there's a lot of casualties like that. Um, the uh, main photograph there shows, you know, I'm actually looking upwards into a gap at the end of a, a, a roof. Um, and there's a lot of pipistrels there. And some of them are youngsters, and some of them are ad adults. They very quickly grow from uh, about pretty big compared to the mother. They're roughly 20% the size of the mother when they're born, which is another reason they can only have one baby because a very pregnant bat flying around feeding for herself and for the growing embryo um, can't, can't carry too many bats. Um, so by late July, they're big enough to fly. They're as big as their mothers. Um, and, uh, and that's when they become a nuisance sometimes in, in houses because they appear and they're not always very good at finding the way back to where they've come from and they turn up in people's bedrooms and I get called, you know, rescue us from these bats, this sort of thing. So um, as soon as the young start to fly, the, the females start dispersing from the nursery roost. And um, then uh, once they've kind of recovered a bit, um, then there are males hanging about waiting to attract them to their roost, to have a little harem. So, for example, this uh, male noctule is singing and calling females to his tree hole. And this is in August. Um, and here's a, a male soprano pipistrelle. Uh, we found these in a bat box in end of July. And so there's a male on the left and three of his harem on the right. Um, we missed, when we we're getting them out of the bat box, there was a couple more flew, flew off. So we assume these were two other females. So he, he had a harem of five. Uh, at that time, they're not really ready to mate, but he's attracting them and he's, you know, he's persuading them to stay with him during the autumn um, so that they can carry on the mating. And that's the year. Okay, so now to more specifics. And this is where we start talking about trees and finding them in trees. Um, Lysler's bat until 2009 were thought to be only in one little part of Scotland, Cree Valley and Glen Trool, because for years people have been inspecting the bat boxes there, and we're finding these bats, but they were only inspected in the, in the autumn. Uh, we didn't really know much about them, uh, but for, for a particular reason, I became interested, well, I was always interested in finding out more about these bats, but unfortunately, they were just a bit too far away um, for me to, to really get into it. But um, 2010, uh, we decided, um, myself and a couple of other people, to try and radio track uh, Lysler's bats, because we knew we could find them in the boxes in the forest there. And so we, we looked through all the boxes that had been put up by RSPB, by uh, a, 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 an organization called the Cree Valley uh, Woodland, Cree Valley Woodland Trust. Um, 
not quite right, but uh, uh, it unfortunately is no longer going. But it was a it was a group that was uh, developing the native trees in the Cree Valley because the Cree Valley was largely uh, conifer plantations, and they were trying to establish a, a ribbon at, at least of native trees up the Cree Valley and Glen Trool. Um, so this is where we found the first one and put a radio tag on him, and uh, we found the first uh, roosts, na natural roosts in trees, thanks to that, that bat. Uh, but the second male was found uh, in a bat box further up on the edge, on the end of Glen Trool, Loch Trool, um, and, and we really tracked him as well. We really tracked three males at that time in different parts of the Cree Valley and Glen Trool. It's only a rough indication, but this male never went further than about a kilometer. Uh, it never went further uh, east along, along Loch Trool. He stayed in this area, uh, in this patch of uh, semi native woodland. Um, well, actually, Glen Trool is famous for being the um, the type locality for now is it the pedunculate oak, the northern one? So the type locality is here. So there are some fine oaks there, and that's the sort of place that he liked to to roost. And what we found was that uh, the the males here have little territories. Um, the one the one in the the previous loch. Um, never went far either, more you know, a kilometer or two kilometers. Um, and uh, they had these territories, but there was no sign of uh, a nursery roost. Uh, but what we were interested in finding was the sort of trees that they were living in. Um, surprising sort of tree that you would find a bat roosting in, uh, these sort of spindly oaks, but right up the top, uh, there is a a structure there that's probably probably where his roost was, but this tree wasn't climbable um, to actually investigate. Uh, this is one that was climbable, you know, quite a substantial oak, and uh, what and the 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 male we call them this one we call them Bruce Bruce. Um, because Robert de Bruce actually slaughtered an English army up there, um, but we'll not go into that. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so this uh, feature where there's been a, a, a pruning cut and you get some rot going in and there are places that bats can go in. So that's the sort of place that uh, he was using there. Um, what we found was if, if we found a bat in a bat box and took them out and put a tag on, he never went back there. They weren't stupid. Uh, um, but, you know, he, he, this, all the bats would have several roosts that they could go into, um, in a, in, even in this small area. This is another tree that was used by another, uh, the third, third bat that we had tagged at that time. It's a nice ash, probably not there anymore, thanks to ash dieback, but um, uh, it had a feature that we reckoned that the bat was in. Okay, so what we were interested in doing was finding a nursery, a maternity nursery roost of these bats. And we knew that Killeen Country Park, which I'd been to quite a lot, is in the Ayrshire, east of, west of Scotland, sorry, um, had noctules. And I just had an idea that they weren't noctules, they were actually lysless bats, because using a bat detector, the calls are very similar. And in, you know, years ago, we weren't always very good at telling them apart. Now we use recordings and we can run them through a computer and you know, get a much better handle on, on the calls. Um, but uh, this is where we went, lots of lovely trees, and we managed to catch three bats we called them uh, Ailsa and Craig, first of all, and then we got a third bat who was a female, so we called her Betty. So actually we had A, B, and C. Um, uh, but obviously uh, Ailsa Craig is the Paddy's milestone, so I'm sitting out in the, in the Clyde there, um, which we could see much of the time. 
in the daytime anyway. Um, so this is this is one with a, a transmitter fitted, um, sort of glued on the back there. You can just see the white patch of patch of glue on the photograph on the right. Um, these tr transmitters are tiny. They um, for this size of bat, a medium sized bat, we use tr transmitters which are 0.45 of a gram, um, and they will only stay on the bat for, you know, if you're lucky, two weeks. It can, generally, it's uh, a week or so. I've had problems with them coming off as, in as little as three days. Um, so, and these these cost around about 150, 180 pounds each, and they're one off. So it's not something you in, in, uh, have to um, go into lightly, uh, and it's not cheap. Um, so there's got to be a good reason for doing that. Plus, it's got to be a good reason for disturbing the bat in the way that we do by sticking this sort of uh, little rucksack on its back uh, and uh, and bothering them by following them around. We actually found that if you get too near the tree where a bat's roosting, then they, they know and they'll disappear. Um, uh, we, and they get, they get to know that if there are people around with torches, and and beeping sounds of the uh, of the receiver, uh, then it frightens them off. So we have to be quite wary about tracking these. Um, but we tracked them to. Uh, fortunately, we managed to track bats uh, to a nice big roost. Um, on the left there, it's, it's it's very difficult to to get good photographs of this this one, but it's a a tall uh, Scots pine. Um, with uh, a hole further up, and there were 33 Lysler's bats in that tree. Uh, that night, uh, they emerged, and then they never went back. Um, uh, they came out, and they went to another tree, which is only about 10 meters away. Um, and uh, that became the main roost. But you can see, in some cases, you can get an idea of the features where the bats might be roosting. You know, again, a, 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 a sort of wound, um, a healed part of the tree where you've got rot going in and going upwards. Most of these um, wounds which heal, you don't get the rot going upwards. Mostly the rot goes downwards uh, because that's where it's dampest. And that's no good for bats. Um, you might get birds nesting in there, but but it's rare when you get the rot going upwards. Um, and the one on the right there is a, a temporary roost that, for one bat. And you can see uh, uh, you sometimes get this fe feature where a, a tree will grow up and have a, a double leader. Um, and then the, the two leaders will grow together again. So you've then got an enclosed space. Uh, sometimes it's really enclosed, nice tight enclosed space, and you can get a decent number of bats in there. This was just a, a temporary use, roost used by one, one of our radio track bats. Um, again, a, a beech rot hole in this tree next to the car park. I think it was the one on the left. And that's a, a close up, which you can just about see um, the rot hole there. And that had about six bats in it, or well, nine bats, I'd say, say there. Um, but this was the, the main roost. Um, this is the, the top left photograph shows the, the tree from ground level in general. And then um, detail on the, on the right, uh, but, but out of sight. We couldn't actually see where, where the hole was. But we had uh, bats stayed there for most of the summer. And I went back in August, and there was still 27 lies of spats emerging from there. Um, and that this just gives you an idea. Um, there's on the top of the map there, you've got Killeen Castle and Killeen Country Park. And within the country park, the red spots show the various tree roosts. The blue spot is where we, we caught them, where we had the catching nets. Um, and the foraging 
area went as far as Kirk Oswald, Turnberry Pond, Turnberry, Maidens. Uh, they would fly up and down the, the main street in Maidens sometimes. Uh, but one of the favorite foraging areas was um, Turnberry Golf Course, which of course is now Trump Turnberry. Um, and probably uh, wandering about in the golf course in the night as we did in 2011, I probably, I can't imagine we'd be allowed to do that um, anymore. Anyway, um, they never went northwards. They always went to that area. You know, the, the foraging was over fields, it was over woodland, uh, it was over the water, the pond. Um, we went back in, in the autumn, in October, and again, as I say, it wasn't me. I was just standing at the bottom of the tree, uh, taking photographs sometimes. And this was, the, this was the main roost. So this is Stuart up the tree, trying to get a photograph. And so that's his knee. He's pointing the camera downwards on the right uh, hand photograph um, to, to show that hole. And there was a sort of a, uh, a space a uh, sort of pipe-like space inside there. And this is what we found. These, are, these big old Scots pines were good for uh, bat roosts because you get a, a branch torn off and then where the branch is torn off, you get rot. Uh, and uh, going, if it goes upwards like that, then um, that's where the, the bats were. That's a, where the bats will roost. Um, you know, this is a sort of place, again, you might, look at a tree and say, oh, well, yes, that's bound to have bats in it. But again, I say, often these holes don't lead anywhere. This one did. Um, and uh, this is uh, Stuart looking into it with a, a fiber optics endoscope. This was after the bats had gone, of course. We didn't want to disturb them while they were there. Um, and another tree with a nice hole, and this time an ash tree. Um, 2012, we went back and they moved around a bit. They did use that, uh, that uh, main Scots pine, uh, but they also went about 200 meters away to another Scots pine where the tree roost um, for up to 18 bats was in, um, in, this, in this shearing crack, we called it. In other words, the, the weight of the branches caused a as a, a break in the tree, and there was a good enough hole in there for the, the bats to use. Um, this, this is where they ended up that summer, um, which was very strange. It was a, it was a, well, a well dead tree, um, a, a conifer, and it had a hole in it at about this height. And, and I filmed these and there were some like 37 bats emerging from that hole. Um, and I, I later used endoscope to see where the hole went. It went up about 50 centimeters um, inside that tree. So they move around a lot. It's, it's very, very important to realize. Now, um, there was a bit of a gap where we, we'd gone to Aaron. There are lots of Liza's bats on Aaron. In fact, we counted over two weeks, we counted nine different males singing uh, on Aaron, uh, but we, we only caught one female, so she hadn't bred. Uh, we, we tracked two males and one female there, but there was plenty of other bats. And again, it's, it's an, an area like the Cree Valley, Grand Lentrul, where there are male territories and there are singing there late summer and uh, waiting for females to turn up and uh, spend the winter with them, hopefully. Um, but this is where we, we suspected there would be a nursery roost down in um, Galloway. The, the, basically, it's the glen to the east of the Cree Valley, the Palneur Glen. Um, not, not a lot of... Um, Habitation there, small number of farms, all forestry, uh, but with patches of um, native woodland as well. And we caught um, 
our lysis bats there and uh, tracked them back to this tree. Now, as far as we know, this is the only Norway spruce with a, a nursery roost of bats, of any bats, that's been recorded in the whole of the UK. Uh, so it's quite unique. Um, and it had a particular kind of scarring, which is obviously formed early on in its life. And so the scarring had, has uh, de developed a bit of rotting inside. So there was enough space inside there for initially about 30 lysless bats. The following year, we actually counted 58 um, in, that, in that hole. So this was the main roost. This tree was about 80, 85 years old getting to the end of its life. And it was a little stand of trees. And unfortunately, trees are fairly temporary in the landscape, in the scheme of things. And after the winter, um, the tree had been blown over, but was resting against another one. So it was upright and stayed there. We went back that summer and we found the bats were still there in even bigger numbers. Uh, they were using that tree. Um, but then next winter, that was the tree, uh, completely gone, completely fallen. Um, and uh, I did consider, well, I talked to the forestry people about cutting a section of that tree uh, with the tree hole and putting up, but they said, no, just too dangerous. Trees which are under tension, if you put a chainsaw through them, they can spring up and uh, and there were a lot of other dead trees around about it, and they said, no, you know, for safety reasons, we can't do that. Anyway, so it was a shame. So the following, following summer, um, 2019, we decided to go back and investigate where the, where the bats might have gone to. Um, and this is just to show you what the radio tag is like. You can see there's a, a long... Um, I think it is stainless steel, the, the uh, antenna that hangs from it and, and the little um, transmitter at the top. Now, the problem with these transmitters is that they run off a, a battery and the battery actually limits how small you can make them. You can make the electronics very small, but you can't make the battery that small. So that limits the, the minimum size of these. Um, and the sort of general rule for, for the, uh, the mass of a, uh, a radio tag on a mammal is that it shouldn't be more than 5% of the, the weight of the mammal. All right, so that limits the size that, uh, of the, the tag. Um, so there's one uh, with, it, with its, I think it's a him, that one, uh, with his tag on the back um, just before he's being released. Um, and this is where that tree had been and had fallen to the left of this, uh, of where we are standing there. And this is what we were using to actually catch the bats. This is what's called a triple high. Each mist net is 2.4 meters. And we have three mist nets, one above the other, and it's a pulley system. You can't, you can't uh, fully, you can't add, uh, can't make it three times 2.4 because they do have to overlap a bit, all right? Um, but it is quite high and it's quite difficult to get these things up. And um, the first bats that, <laughs> that we saw actually just went over the top. So they do fly rather high, um, but we did catch, did manage to catch then. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing up. 2018 was when we saw them going over the top, and uh, we only actually re radio tied one bat there, uh, 2018. But uh, yeah, um, 2019, uh, we also tagged a, a male in a in a box quite a dis di that was found in a box quite a distance away. But we didn't uh, concentrate much on him because we were interested in seeing where these females were going to that were found uh, that had lost their roost, had lost their, um, their knobby spruce roost. Um, and uh, well, we didn't find, we found that they moved around a bit and we didn't find any one particular tree that they were using. 
uh, but they were using mainly oaks and ash trees. Um, so this is a this is one of the oaks. Um, another one on the right, with the arrow showing um, this an interesting oak because it had had about three or four different holes, and used by different bats, um, different species of bats actually. So this there's one of the um, ashes near this farm with the oak woodland in the back where um, where we think we, the, the, the main roost was, although we never managed to narrow it down. Because um, we have a limited time to do these things. These are all um, groups of volunteers that have come. In fact, if I go back, we even had a, a volunteer from Poland, this guy here, who is a very experienced, um, very experienced in radio tracking. It was great to have him there. Um, and there's another ash that's near that farm that we had the bats staying in. This is, yeah, this is the guy I was talking about, Grushek, and uh, having to wade across to get to uh, a tree on the far side, another, another ash tree. Uh, where we had one of the females. So this shows the distribution of these trees in, the, in this part of the glen, the spruce that had fallen at the top there, and one, two, three, four different roosts used by the females at different times during one week. Um, okay, and this was a female that went much further south. Well, 4.5 kilometers further south um, down the glen and used a, a rather spindly ash. Again, one that we couldn't climb to, to find out more about. Um, and this is the uh, um, two oak woods where these bats seem to concentrate. So the, the, the conclusion from this was that even though Galloway Forest is you know, a huge commercial forest area. Uh, within the forest, there are these remnants of sort of semi-natural old woodlands, which is where you've got the trees that can be used, not just by um, lives of bats, but uh, this is an example of that tree I talked about with the different holes. Uh, and while we were watching this for a, a bat that we were ready tracking, we realized it was quite noisy. And it was noisy because it was full of long-eared bats. And uh, we counted 52 brown long bats coming out of that hole um, on, on the right-hand side there. Okay, so the, the last bit I'm going to talk about, I hope I'm not overrunning too much. Uh, um, last bit I'm going to talk about is a different kind of bat. And this, this comes to last year. Now, obviously, 2019 was the last year, summer that we really had a chance to do this sort of radio tracking. 2020, things had to stop. 2021, it got going a bit because um, this little building, which is at the south end of this Palnuer Glen, a place called Kirk Tree. And Kirk Tree is a nice center for mainly for mountain biking, but you know, there's lots of walking trails based there. It's just a bit about five miles to the east of uh, Newton Stewart. Uh, and, and you know, a popular tourist spot run by what's now Forestry and Land Scotland. And this, this building, which is close, close to what's now car park and visitor center, uh, had been a little office building up until about 10 years ago. Well, in fact, it was disused 10 years ago and it probably around about 2010 that it became disused. And at that time, uh, Forestry Commission, as it was, uh, wanted to knock it down. And they had a survey done, uh, not by me, by um, uh, uh, Direct Ecology, who's also based in, in Dunblane. Um, and uh, it turned out that uh, there was evidence there from the droppings DNA tested droppings showing that these could be a, bra a brant's bat roost, or this could be a bat brant's bat roost. And so if, if it was, then this is the first place in Scotland that there was a roost of these bats. And so 
Nature Scott or SNH as it was then said, oh, no, you can't have a, a license to knock that down. Um, you need to know more about it. So nothing happened. Nothing happened until 2021. And they said, look, we really need to knock this building down because it's getting a bit, you know, it's uh, starting to go. It's got no floor inside or the floor's rotting away. Um, it's, it is out of the way, but for safety reasons, they need to take it down. So they got me, um, my, my company, to survey this, to establish what, what, what use are bats there, are bats using it. Uh, this is relevant to trees, by the way. I'll come to this. Um, but uh, actually, our conclusion was, no, there are no bats there, and there are no branch bats there. And we, we, However, we did have bats which are closely related to branch bat, and that's uh, whiskered bats. And because they're so similar, and because you can't tell them apart with using a bat detector, we actually caught them. Uh, we put up nets and caught them because um, they were flying very close to that roof. At first, we thought they were emerging from the roof, but no, uh, over a number of nights and using video, infrared video, definitely not coming from the roof, but zipping over the top. Um, so we knew every night they would fly that route. And so if you put a net up in front of there, and well, hopefully you catch them, and we did. We caught two males in uh, June, and then we came back again in August, and we caught one female. Uh, and they were all whiskered bats. And just to be absolutely sure, we collected droppings from these bats, sent them off, DNA, no, they're definitely uh, whisker bats, not brant bats. So we actually have had found no evidence of brant bat there, but only whisker bat, which is interesting because it's an unusual species. Um, but uh, I wanted to know a bit more about where these bats were coming from. They, they weren't coming from the building. Um, there's a building nearby, which used to be the visitor center and droppings in the roof there have came back from DNA as Soprano pipistrelle, common pipistrelle, brown long-eared, and whiskered bat. So four species using the building next door, uh, which is great because the Forestry Commission wanted that building to be used for, for bats uh, uh, so that they wouldn't go back here. Um, and so I persuaded them, because it didn't take a lot of persuading. I said, look, can you leave this building another year even though there's not a bat roost there and you can knock it down without getting a license. That was my decision. I'm just looking at Chris up there because he, he's familiar with that sort of decision. Um, uh, and uh, anyway, I said, well, we know where they fly. So if you can leave them another year, we'll come back in the summer and we'll track, try and catch these bats and track them and see if we can find a roost. Um, which is what we did. Now, I'll just digress a little bit because you can perhaps see that the gutter along the edge of the roof there um, is missing. Part of it is missing, all right? So you've got these little holes at the edge. Uh, and this is one of the places we thought bats might actually be coming from. Well, when we put a mist net up in front of that play, that part, we actually got a blue tit, and the blue tit was going in to one of these holes. Um, so we'd put the net up just around about sunset, and we caught this little blue tit going in, got hopelessly tangled. 15 minutes before we were expecting the bats to come out, or come you know, from wherever they're coming. And so uh, we, it was so tangled, we just had to cut a hole in the net and take, take the blue tit out, and somebody sat there and pulled all the bits of thread out of the, the blue tit's um, uh, feathers. And so subsequently, every time we've been there, there's been a blue tit gone in that hole. And, and what we do is we just wait with the, the nets not actually up until the blue tit's in there. Use a torch, you can see it. Right, we can put the nets up. So, uh, but it was amazing. It was there uh, all summer in 2021, and he was, he was there 2022 as well. He, I presume. Um, 
anyway. Um, okay, so that was last summer. We had a week. Um, we caught four whisker bats the first night, two males, two females. We put radio tags on three of them. Now, these are smaller bats, so they needed smaller tags. So these were about 0.3 of a gram, these tags that we put on them. Um, and uh, we tracked these. Oh, sorry, going backwards. We tracked these. All right, just to show you distribution of whisker bats, you can see that uh, good numbers throughout England, Wales, um, but they become a bit rarer in Scotland. The, the most northerly roost that I know of actually is in Stirlingshire, in the west west of Stirlingshire. But they're, but it's the only one we know from around here. Um, so they are pretty rare. But the, but uh, going down to southwest Scotland or the borders, good places for bats. Um, okay, so radio tracking involves following them all night from sunset to sunrise until they go to bed. Um, and then what we do is we establish where they've gone at sunrise and then come back, go, go and have a sleep, and then come back in the afternoon and uh, look for the roosts. And we found that they were using trees uh, and they weren't roosting together. So although they were all charging up this little alley between two buildings at the same time every night, um, they were actually roosting in different places. So we had one female roosting in a, a dead oak. Another female uh, actually used three different trees in the five days that we were following her. This is just to show <laughs> uh, some fantastic trees in, around there. And uh, this is one of the rare photo photographs I've got of really good ivy for bats. Now, mostly ivy is leafy, it's small uh, stemmed, uh, narrow stemmed, and uh, people get hung up in ivy and bats, but no, bats don't like these sort of leafy uh, areas. That they can't negotiate, they can't go in through um, a lot of foliage. But when you've got ancient ivy like this, you've got big solid um, trunks virtually, uh, that have spaces behind them that potentially could be bat roosts. So that, that's the sort of place that I would, you know, you might find bats using. Okay, so we're just about finished. Um, just to show you that uh, that female in that dead tree, that old dead tree, uh, for the last couple of nights or days times, so, sorry, she moved into uh, near the chimney in this house, which is only about 100 meters away from uh, from that tree. And the male uh, started off in a tree, but he moved into the roof of this, uh, this building, the courtyard building, next to the, uh, you can just see the end of the um, little hut on the left. And this is the building on the, on the right that has got places for bats to get in. And it's been adapted inside to, to have uh, good roosting spots for bats. Um, and what was amazing to me was how small an area that these bats covered. Um, this is just a, a rough outline, but uh, we know that they didn't go north of the V is one of the viewpoints that we had. Uh, a viewpoint was where we stood with our ra uh, radio receivers. Um, there was another viewpoint down at the right there. And the, the third one was at the, at the building uh, where we caught them. In the, in the middle. Um, so the roosts you can see are one, two, three trees in the north. Uh, the roost building um, next, next to the hut, uh, a roost tree that the male used over on the, on the bottom right, and the two roosts used by the female down there. And during the night, most of this is wooded, and uh, that was their foraging area. 0.4 of a square kilometer, which is tiny compared to what we'd expected. Um, just to show you, this is, we're not going to this, but this is a, from a study in Ireland. This is more what I was expecting. Um, whisker bats, about 40 of them in, in a roost. Uh, and this is a, 
uh, uh, representation of where they were flying and foraging and roosting. The little asterisks show different roosts in that area. So the, you can see that um, from this, 13 bats were um, followed and their mean home range was 2.3 kilometers squared. So, uh, you know, four or five times the size of the, uh, the area that we were experiencing. Uh, but then these, these were females with young and, they're, and there's a lot of them in one place and they're having to go further to feed. Our bats didn't, were males and a, fe, a, a male, sorry, and two females that weren't actually feeding young. And so they just didn't have to go very far. Um, so just for comparison, uh, our area is, the area that I showed you is right down in the, the bottom of, of this uh, outline. Uh, but this was one female that we followed in 2018, one female, Liza's bat, and we had to chase her all over the place. And uh, uh, this showed the, the area that she covered as one bat of about 20 kilometers squared. So that's what we were experiencing for Liza's bat. But these, these whiskered bats were just so easy to follow. Um, and that's about it. Um, just some thanks to the people involved. Okay, you want the microphone. Um, I don't know, actually. If we've got time, I, can, I, I was going to show you a radio tag and a receiver. It, it doesn't, I mean, this is fine. Okay, well, Have we got time for that? Yeah. Um, I just thought, I was actually doing a, a, a training. Um, I'm aware I'm not standing. I better stand over here. All right. Uh, this was, I was doing some training at the weekend for, for people. And so I had this already. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of what we, what we do. This is, this is the receiver. I don't know whether this has been picked up by. This is the receiver and this is the antenna that we use. Um, and I have a radio tag that I got somebody to attach to a torch, a battery powered torch. So you won't be able to see, see it, but you will be able to see the torch. So there's the antenna sticking out here and the, the electronics bit is in there. And when I turn on the torch, um, and, and perhaps Roy can hold it and stand over there a bit. And so you're the bat. So Roy's the bat. Uh, and what I'm going to do is see if we can pick, pick up Roy. So this is tuned to the frequency that that is transmitting. Just hold it straight up, right? No, just hold, yeah, that's fine. Well, no, if you stay there, well, I can show you, this is very directional, okay? So I'm pointing straight at him because I know that's where the tag is. And actually, but I think just because we're in this room, it's picking up. Normally you get it going a lot quieter. You can hear that. It's gone a lot quieter. It's not pointing at him. So basically this is what we're doing uh, when we don't know where exact, exactly the bat is. We have to just do this sort of thing and try and work out 
where exact where's the best direction and then follow the bat uh, it's also got this instrument has also got a an indicator on it basically i'm turning a sensitivity knob so i turn down so there's an ind indicator that's actually showing how strong the signal is and so you know this is an artificial situation he's very close we're in in the wild we're trying to pick them up perhaps a kilometer or two away uh, which is possible if you have good line of sight if you're in woodland or undulating land it's it's much less it might only be a, a few hundred meters um, but yeah that's you can, and you can hear it's slightly louder that way than that way because the antenna is in line there so if you've got a bat flying and the antenna is horizontal you can tell by doing that and it goes quieter and that you can say right it's it's flying and if it's moving around and when it goes into a tree uh it's the the sound will will fluctuate a bit will move around a bit because it's moving around in the tree and the antenna isn't fixed so you can actually tell with a bit of practice you can tell something about what the bat's doing um i i really attract a kind of bat called lesser horseshoes and they when they go into a roost they hang like little plums and it's very very clear when they're flying uh you can tell because they're like that but when they're roosting the strong signal is is like that you know none of the bats that we have are as as uh, easy to to uh, to uh, follow as, as these bats in that way but anyway that's just to give you an idea and this um i've got two of these instruments the other one i bought second hand from the scottish wildlife trust scottish beaver trial because it was being used uh, they, they i think they had two of them and one of them, they decided after a year or two, they only needed one. Uh, and so one of them actually fell into the, was drowned in the water. So they sent it off, had it refurbished, and they, and they sold it to, to me. So I got it, you know, I got it cheaper than new price from the beaver trial. Yeah. Okay. A... So do you want to take the... Yes. Oh. Now, do we have any questions? Yeah, Jan's got a question. I better wait, 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 wait. I've got two very quick questions. I was amazed when you said the radio track has only stayed on for a few days, if that. Is that because it's so delicate, so small and delicate? Because that cost a fortune. It's, it's, <laughs> it's um it's deliberate because we don't want it to stay on for too long i mean we may only be following them for a week or two anyway and we use uh, a latex adhesive uh, basically to put the the tag on the bat you you trim a little bit of the fur between the shoulder blades to make a sort of valley and then you glue the tag on at that point uh, and you, you do it in such a way that you hope it'll stay on for long enough. Um, but it, uh, it does fall off eventually. It actually pulls away the fur and leaves a little bald patch on the back of the, the bat. It does grow in again. The, the fur does grow in again. But, but yeah, um, it's, a, it's not a bad thing. The transmitter, these small ones, you see, because, the, because as I say, the, the size of them or the weight of them is limited by the size of the battery um these um the battery will only last a short time so you know you want ideally you want them to come off when the battery is gone uh, about that uh beavers are a bit bigger they can take big tags with big batteries uh, which will last for weeks or months uh but little bats very short time right Oh, let's have a close question. <laughs> have you ever used the um, night sight? 
at a distance? Do they do the bats show up as little white blobs all over the trees? What are you talking about? The night sights. You mean um infrared. Not infrared. Uh thermal imaging. Yeah, we do use thermal imaging, but um they're very expensive. <laughs> so that's a that's a limitation. But uh Thermal imaging can be used to actually show where the bats are in the tree. Yeah, I haven't done that myself, but uh, uh, on a bird trip, and you could look with your binoculars from the sea. Oh, right, it's one of the birds on the top of that tree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's fifteen birds. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's great the technology, but even the cheapest of these will cost about three thousand pounds, and good ones are fifteen thousand. So um, <laughs> it's li limiting. It's only a conservation drop in. <laughs> no, is the answer. Yeah. Right. Another question of where, please. We live in Dunblane as well, and we've got uh, two, at most three bats that come out. What would they be? And do you think they roost in the trees? Because we've got quite a few trees in our gardens. So if you see. <laughs> if you see bats foraging, they're almost certainly going to be pipistrelles. And uh, because they, they feed in the open, they feed between head height and tree height, um, and they come out earlier than other species. Uh, so, um, so they're likely to be pipistrelles, and many of the pipistrelles are roosting in buildings. So within Dunblane, they're more likely to be somewhere in the buildings. I know one or two buildings in Dunblane uh, that have. I, I better repeat that. How, how, what is the area that they fly over? Um, again, it depends on, you, you know, you saw these didn't go more than about 500 meters. Um, Long-eared bats will, will only travel about a kilometer or two. Uh, Pipistrels, a um, friend of mine did a PhD on Galloway Forest Soprano Pipistrels, and she found the furthest they flew was about 21 kilometers. Yeah. Uh, um, and within Dunblane, no problem going from one side of Dunblane to the other. So you could see them around you, but they might be roosting at the other end. Um, so, you know, <laughs> no. <laughs> or in June Tarsen. And if it's, and if it's uh, for example, the Benton's bats, they follow rivers and they, um, or, or lochs, you know. And so they've got a linear feeding area and the Benton's bats at uh, Radio Tract in the UK have been known to go 20, 25 kilometers. God. Others others will only go two kilometers, you know. Um, it, it depends on, on the individual. But uh, I, I myself uh, Radio Tract in northwest, northeast Poland, a kind of bat called the pond bat, which is like a Debenders bat, but a bit bigger. Um, and these were traveling 20 kilometers. They were, they were actually traveling. Some of them, we had to follow, follow them from uh, Poland into Lithuania because they were crossing the border there and, and then back again in the morning. Uh, do they roast in the cathedral? I remember that on one of the... Uh, no, no, but... <laughs> Uh, occasionally the, the, the bat turns up in the cathedral uh, because I was once asked to see if I could catch this bat that was flying in the cathedral, uh, which is a bit big to, to be <laughs> catching bats in. But what I did was I put a bat detector overnight on the pulpit. And sure enough, this bat was <laughs> flying during the night and then disappearing in the daytime. And basically, you know, there's so many curtains and corners, these things can go into, but no, they don't roost there. But you must have seen the, the famous carved bat. Carving, the yeah. The carved Carving. bat. There's a, there's a photograph on the, on the post, uh, on the notice board outside of this 500 year old carving that's on the- um, What are they called? 
you know the seats in the choir, yeah. Where you misericord. Yeah, you put oh, the seat up, and underneath it there's the uh, carvings. Yeah. So it's 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 pretty unusual. I tell you what, I'll put it on Facebook. I did a, did a Facebook post on it years ago. I'll yeah, put it yeah. on again. It's lovely carving. Right. <laughs> Lots of questions. How well are bats actually doing? I mean, most other species we're talking about declining. Are bats holding their own? A very good question. You know, why are bats protected? Uh, they're protected because, as I explained, they only have one baby a year. So the, uh, the roosts are fragile. If you disturb a, a bird's nest, then the bird can probably go and lay another clutch of eggs and rear some more. Bat can't do that. It's put, female puts all her energy into one baby a year and not necessarily every year. And sometimes some species of bats won't breed until they're two or three years old. The, uh, the positive side of that is they can live many years. Um, the oldest bat recorded is actually a Brant's bat and it's, it's in its forties. Um, so they, they can live a long time. Um, but to come back to your question, some species are doing okay. And in much of Scotland, they seem to be doing okay. But some species uh, that are more specific in their requirements, the requirements for feeding, requirements for roosting, um, like the, the the greater horseshoe bat is the best example down the southwest of England, south of England, southwest Wales. Um, it, it's declined more than uh, probably 99% over the last century. Um, so all bats are threatened. Um, and that's why they were protected since 1984, sorry, 1981, the Wildlife and Countryside Act has protected all species in the UK. We did have European legislation on top of that, it's now gone, um, but we always did, you know, since 1981, we had all bats protected. Has it actually gone? Because the government said it was going to keep it all. Well, basically, <laughs> It's a tricky thing because um, you know we no longer have no longer uh, EU members, um, and the legislation that protects wildlife is uh, currently it's assumed that the legislation is the same uh, until it's replaced by Scots UK legislation, starting with uh, you know English legislation and then Scottish legislation and Irish as well, or England and Wales first, uh, and then we, but, but we have a different legal system, separate legal system. So, um, you know, uh, Scotland will have its separate laws, for, more or less for following the English laws. Um, so it, we are at a bit of a, a, a stage where the, there's a lot of debate about, you know, how wildlife should be protected. I think it's, I think it's the, um, in the great crested newt that's, that's the animal that's being most hammered because uh, it's the one that gets in the way of development so much and, and people don't see why it's protected. Uh, no, no. A couple of questions online as well. Yep. There's a couple of people have asked, is the likely loss of ash trees from dieback going to have an impact on bats? Ash, ash dieback. Uh, good question. <laughs> Uh, ash dieback is bound to have because the the trees that I found are best for bats are oak, ash, and old Scots pine, and therefore you know losing a lot of ash trees, uh, especially you know older ash trees that have the right sort of uh, holes will limit the, um, the the you know the tree roosts. Um, but you know, you know we've been limiting humans have been living limiting the tree roosts for long enough, which is why the bats are all moving into buildings. Uh, not all of them, but you know, the, uh, um, most of them do, the, certainly the ones we get in Scotland. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the bats that are much more dependent on trees like the noctule or the um, lysis bat, yes, they would be affected. Is there any evidence of Woodpeckers predating bats in tree holes. Um, 
Bats are quite good at getting out of the way of uh, predators. Um, we, you know, we know that woodpeckers will attack bird attack bird boxes and get at the um, the, the fledgling there. Um, perhaps that's why you know uh, houses are are safer for uh, for for bats. So that, you know there may well be predation by by woodpeckers. But on the on the other hand, woodpeckers do provide roost holes for the likes of noctule. You know, so noctule do like woodpecker holes. Um, there are no noctules in, in Ireland. There are lizards, but no noctules. And one of the reasons there are no noctules, there are no woodpeckers. Um, until recently, people have started introducing woodpeckers into Ireland. <laughs> Interesting to see what happens to the bats. Well, We'd you. better call a mm -hmm. halt Sorry. to it, I think. Is there any other special questions? No? Um, well, thank you very much. The great advantage Oh, it's Jan's last night, so we'll leave her. <laughs> no, it's just that um, you mentioned this harem that the males have. Are there many more females than males? The question is, are there more males than females or females than males? Uh, and the answer is the, the, um, they're equal in number. <laughs> um, so females collect together in nursery roosts in the summer. Males are uh, single, um, you know, scattered around all year round. Um, sometimes you get small male roosts, but th that's unusual. Uh, but no, they're, when they're born, um, equal numbers, more or less. No. Males are competing. Males are competing for the females. Um, so basically, a male, male pipistrelle, come late summer, um, will emerge from its roost, feed for an hour, and then spend the rest of the night flying around singing and attracting females, showing I'm a big, strong male bat, you know, come and join me. Um, and they are, you know, they are competing with each other. So they, you know, uh, they're showing it's like uh, blackbirds competing by singing. Um, uh, so it's the it's the fittest, strongest one that will breed. Can I, I'm going to ask the last question. I've always been intrigued by the fact that here in Scotland we have sh sh in the sen in the middle of summer we have such sh short periods of darkness. Does this change the behaviour of bats, or is it? You, you explained that in the north of Scotland, there are very few bats. Could this be the reason for it? Uh, no, uh, there are more species of bats in Scandinavia um, than there are in Scotland, in northern Scotland. And there are more species of bats above the, uh, you know, near the Arctic Circle. Um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the earliest papers I read, which I was fascinated by, I think it was published in 1960s, was a, a, a Scandinavian researcher, I can't remember if it was Swedish or Finnish, who studied bats before bat detectors by observing them, because it never got dark. Right, so so he, he did his uh, research on whisker bats in Scandinavia. No, it's, it's more to do with survival during the winter. Uh, uh, if you have mild winters, it's more difficult for a bat to survive. If you have a, a reliable winter, then bats can go into hibernation and stay like that. Um, but if you've got temperature fluctuations, then bats will wake up and use up energy. Um, so, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. Well, I'm intrigued by it because I w work on the pollination of orchids and they're moth pollinated. And they must have a very short period every night to get pollinated up here in Scotland compared with the same species in the south. And Darwin, who studied them, never actually pointed this out, which is surprising. Yeah, it's, in terms of uh, foraging, uh, uh, bats forage on insects mainly in the two peaks of insects during the night. And the two peaks are around about sunset and sunrise. Right. So they may rest in between. Uh, 
So if you've got a long night, uh, then, they're, then they're feeding in these two peaks. If the night's shorter, then they may not go back to roost. They may feed all the time. Oh. Or, you know, there's a very short period between them. So, yeah. Well, I'm going to say thank you very much. That was a great, great talk. We've learned so much, mainly about what we don't know still. So thank you very much. Good. I can't cry. <laughs> Right now, could you could you put the light, the middle switch off? Thanks. I was going to ask how this is a picture on the Facebook site of uh, Central Scotland bat bat group, and that is the uh, the reserve that we used to used to be an SWT reserve, which is in the slate quarry. Uh, above Aberfoyle, it's at the side of the road. It's also got a lot of interesting ferns in it, if that's what uh, turns you on. Anyway, this is John down there, and I think the best thing is to look at the Facebook site, actually, because it's got some superb pictures inside that uh, uh, tunnel, really, isn't it? Tunnel. Did they tunnel to get the slate out? I never think of them. It was a tunnel to connect a higher level to a lower level. It had a little railway running through it. Good Lord. And they put the crude slate in at the top and the tunnel uh, car carried the railway through it. And then it continued all the way down to what's now, you know, the Duke's Pass Road. Yeah. And I'm not sure whether that, that connected up with the railway that went right down to Aberfoyle. So it was, it was connected with uh, oh. transporting crude slate. Oh, right. It, it looks very it's tiny. Slate. Well, look at the, I just Googled uh, the name of the Central Scotland Bat Group, and you'll get some lovely pictures of it. So it's nice to hear it's still going. Right. Well, I've got to, I'd like to talk about what the group has been doing. Can Jan stay? Somebody else make the tea? I want to bring. Okay. Um, <laughs> I will be very brief. I just want to show you what actually we've been doing in the last few weeks. Can I have the first slide then? Uh, one of the things that the planning group is looking at, oh, damn, you'll see why. Uh, this is a new um, wind turbine, or it's an extension of the Earlsbourne wind turbine site uh, into this area, which is two kilometers south of Gargunnock, which you can see at the top of this uh, slide on the A811. That's the main road leading from Stirling to um, oh, west. Uh, we looked at this, of course, as we do all these planning applications for their impact on wildlife, and we are worried about the access road, which you can see snaking across this slide because it goes through an area with a lot of ancient junipers in it. And if you look at the next slide, uh, this is one of the ancient junipers at the top there. We've tried to uh, find out how old they are, but they're several hundred years old. Uh, they're sort of bushes that uh, they fall down on the ground and grow along the ground. Uh, up on the Took Estate, but we've mapped where they were, and you can see in the left-hand side of this is one of the maps that we produced where these junipers are, because they're protected. And um, they're protected both as a, a UK Biodiversity Action Plan species, and it, they're also on the Scottish Biodiversity List. Uh, there were, I've forgotten how many, 36 uh, separate documents associated with this application. So all I could do was really search for the keyword juniper, but I couldn't find it in any of it. But uh, that doesn't mean to say it's not there. Anyway, we will be uh, pointing this out uh, to the planning authorities. So there's a lot of an enormous amount of, of work done by the planning group. Uh, for instance, two of them actually walked all the way up here uh, to look at that uh, site. 
It was exhausting, apparently. So thank you to the planning group. Right, the next slide. Uh, another thing we've been doing in the last couple of weeks is planting out sticky catch fly. Uh, this area of the hillfoots, uh, as I've explained in previous meetings, is, <coughs> is uh, now going to be part of the future forestry estate. And uh, they're keen for us to put sticky catch fly, a really rare plant up there. And uh, the students from the university have been growing them and we've got 120 to put up there. I know it doesn't look very steep this, but I can tell you that when you're there, it does. And uh, I can't really make it up there anymore. So these were two uh, volunteers who took out uh, 20 plants the other day and planted them up the slope there. We've also been planting uh, cowslips, which is more my style on the flat down at the bottom. So that's something else we've been doing, and we hope to do more of that in the next few weeks. All right, the next thing is, and this is why I wanted Jan. <laughs> You'll see, Jan has been a member. Next slide. Jan has been a member of our group for a long time, and uh, she's a stalwart. Uh, and I'm not sure what we're going to do, but today is the last live meeting that she's going to be at. Uh, she's been on our committee since 1987. Here she is. <laughs> uh, she's been on our committee since 1987. And um, to start with, she was the membership secretary in the days. Oh, you were a member of the SWT. Yeah, sorry, I did have it. And hold on, you can't be heard. <laughs> Say it again. I moved to Sterling in 2004. I was in the Clyde group before that. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry, I misread it. It is up there, actually. So Jan was a member of the Clyde and Strathkelvin group of the SWT for a number of years. She moved to Sterling in 2007 and by Later on that same year, I think, she became a member of the committee and she's been absolutely essential uh, since then. So I'm not sure how we're going to uh, cope. Uh, she was the membership secretary uh, for us for many years in the days when we used to send letters to all the uh, new members. Um, the other major job that she's done is to organize meeting venues. For instance, uh, she found this hall when we wanted halls with good internet um, connections. And Jan did all that and organized it with the uh, people who run this uh, hall. She's also run the website off and on. And I did, she's helped with the frog orchid surveys and here she's uh, doing a survey on butterfly orchids at uh, Plain Country Park. She's also organized the frog orchid surveys now, in the year that we were talking about, uh, John did all, uh, John started all his work with the trust. Uh, they had just started uh, to look after a wildflower me meadow, uh, the other side of uh, Kippen, and because it had frog orchids in it, and we're still looking after that meadow. We still go and uh, cut it every year with strimmers and we're just about keeping the frog orchid uh, population going. Well, Jan has actually organized the counts to go with that. And she's also had a major role as the secretary. So I want you all to join us, including those at home, and uh, give uh, Jan a vote of thanks. She doesn't want any presents. She's been very adamant about that. So please join me in saying thank you, Jan. Not sure how we're gonna cope, but thank you very much. Do you want to say something? You, you probably all know that all that remains of that meadow is that the estate that's built on it is called 
what was it called? Orchid, Orchid Park. There's not a single orchid left. So next thing are future meetings. Uh, the calendar group's next talk is one I want to go to. It's given by uh, John Holland, who's a very good speaker. And it's about the marshes at this uh, western, western end of Loch Tay, where there are beavers. But he'll be talking about orchids, I hope. And so that's the calendar group on the 16th of March at St Andrews Hall in uh, Calendar. Next one is our next meeting. Now we've hit a snag with our next meeting. <laughs> hmm? It, uh, well, <laughs> we're having to rethink uh, this talk because too many of the committee are actually, uh, it's half term and they'll be looking after their children then. So I think you're gonna have to watch our, um, uh, Facebook and websites to find out what's going to happen. Now the problem with that is also that it's supposed to be uh, AGM. We're supposed to have a short AGM, which we uh, of course have to have every year. So I think we're going to have to reorganize that. Next one, I've been asked by the Scottish Environmental Link to advertise their webinar. This they think is very important, or I'm sure it is actually, and it's uh, farming for Scotland's uh, future. And the webinars are on Monday the 13th of March from six to 6.45, that's not very long. Uh, and you have to book a place. I'm afraid uh, that I, I only heard about this this evening, so uh, I, I didn't really have time to research it, but I guess if you Google uh, Scottish Environmental Link, you'll find uh, a link to the uh, to this webinar. So thank you all. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, Jan will be making her last cups of tea. So we have to. Well, we have found somebody else who's going to do the tea, I think. But we're always looking for new members, and we're desperately short of them. Uh, we, as you can see, in these evenings, we we've got uh, four or five committee meetings involved in uh, getting the room ready and uh, using Zoom. Uh, uh, and um, I think we want to try and keep Zoom going if we can, but it does use a lot of uh, manpower. I can see in the audience, Dave Bryant, who actually precedes uh, John Haddo in the SWT, and he was one of the founder members. Dave's over here. I think one of the founder members of the local group, weren't you? Yeah. And uh, David Thoroughgood is the only, the other one person that I know was in that founding group. Okay. So I'm sure John will take more questions over tea. So please, the tea is served at the end there at the hatch. <laughs> <laughs>